Every year on Lindau Island in Germany, dozens of Nobel laureates come to meet with hundreds of young scientists. It's rare for so many laureates to gather like this, so I'm taking the opportunity to ask some big questions about the state of medicine today. To try to get a picture of health. I've just heard the story of a man here in Germany who was HIV positive. He developed leukaemia and as part of his treatment for that, he received a bone marrow transplant. But his donor was unlike any other. The donor had a natural immunity to HIV and the treatment cured not only the leukaemia but also the HIV. Could donors like this offer hope to all HIV patients? We know that HIV is a terrible and tenacious disease, but can we really believe in this cure? I needed to talk to someone in the field of virology about the implications of this surprising development. Kirsty Short is a virology researcher who attended this year's Lindau meeting. Now, I've been hearing all about this patient from Berlin who had mm -hmm. a bone marrow transplant and cured his HIV. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit more. It's a pretty unique case, I would say. So as far as I understand it, it was a, a patient who had to receive a bone marrow transplant because he had cancer and he was an HIV positive patient. And what actually happened is that the cells that they transferred to this placement, to, uh, patient to replace his bone marrow, they were from um, another person who had a certain specific genetic mutation. And the genetic mutation is in a gene called CCR5. And that's one of the receptors for HIV. So what they did is for the Berlin patient who had cancer and was HIV positive, they wiped out all of his immune cells. They then transferred these new immune cells from this patient with this strange genetic mutation into that patient. What you see is that because the CCR5 molecule is the entry receptor for HIV, so it lets it, the virus infect the immune cells, if you have all the cells in your body which lack, this molecule, you're not infected with HIV. So this patient has stayed negative for HIV since. It's the gatekeeper, if you like, that's stopping the virus from entering the cell. Is that the...? Viruses need to enter a cell to replicate. They can't replicate without a cell. And different viruses have different signatures on a cell that lets them get into the cell. So yeah, it's a sort of a gatekeeper mechanism, you're right. I mean, it sounds like the start of a cure. <laughs> What's to stop it being rolled out and available to everybody? So it's, it's difficult. Um, I think the first practical point is a bone marrow transplant is not something you do every day and it's not something you ever want to have to go through. So there's risks associated just with the procedure. So that's not necessarily something you want to expose patients to. It's very expensive. So we think about where the burden of HIV is in the world. This is not going to be a feasible option in sub-Saharan Africa. And bone marrow transplants, you really need to have um, good matching between the new cells of the donor and the old cells of the patient. So that's not necessarily always possible. Is this only ever going to be a treatment or is this the start of an approach for a vaccine? I think what this case told us, this receptor, this entry receptor for the virus is obviously very important for the virus to replicate within a human. From a research perspective, targeting this, this molecule could be very important as a preventative mechanism. One of the most eminent scientists in this field is Françoise Barisanoussi. She was in Lindau attending the meeting. Barisanoussi shared the Nobel Prize for the discovery of HIV. I think it's a pretty amazing opportunity to really find out all the in-depth information about HIV from the person who discovered HIV. Since the weather had improved, we met her by Lake Constance. Kirsty and I have been talking about this patient in Berlin who had the bone marrow transplant. I wonder if you think that that's the, the start of a, an avenue to explore for curing HIV. The Berlin patient is what we call for us a proof of concept. That means that uh, telling us it could be possible. We have to be cautious and of course we say that with the technology that we have now, 
we cannot detect the virus. And it is, to my knowledge, the only case of cure. I wonder how you felt when you first realised that the HIV had disappeared in that patient. First of all, I must say I did not believe it. <laughs> <laughs> what we are learning from the Berlin patient is probably a mutation in CCR5 may be important, but the mutation is only in Caucasian. It's not an approach that uh, can be used widely. The mutation is very rare. Uh, only 0.1% uh, of uh, people carrying this mutation are resistant to infection. So we're not clear of even so the link between that it, mutation and the... And it's not yet clear whether there is a relationship between the mutation and the fact that the Berlin patient is cured. So if you had to rank then sort of all the um, biomedical approaches that we're currently doing in terms of creating an, an HIV vaccine, would this sort of approach be high on the list as, as a feasible one? Or no, for me it's not a feasible one at large scale at yeah. all. But then what uh, would you think would be the most, um, out of all the research that's out there? Um, uh, the, you know? the most, uh, I, I, I really believe personally that we don't have yet the strategy. Uh, I, I strongly believe that uh, we have to understand a little bit better the mechanism of latency. Francoise and Kirsty explained to me that latency is where cells are infected with HIV but don't actually produce HIV. They lie dormant, in hiding as it were, and are called reservoirs. Antiretroviral therapy can produce a level of HIV in the blood so low that it is undetectable but latent reservoirs of HIV continue to survive and these can then reactivate. The biggest issue in latency is that the virus is latent in cells in the brain or is it also that it's, there's latency elsewhere like in the gut? Is it latency like, is everywhere. It's everywhere. Okay. It's everywhere. It's in the brain, it's in the gut, it's in the, the lymph node, it's everywhere in the body which makes things very complicated. And when the virus is already integrated into the cells, no drug can have any effect. Why are we looking for a cure when it seems like the treatment, although it doesn't reduce the reservoirs, it does keep the infection under control? Why is it important to look for a cure? <laughs> My answer generally to that as a patient. <laughs> the, the, the other one who has the answer. To know that every day, you have to take a pill for all your life. With knowing, by the way, that after long term, you may have side effects. You may develop cancer, you may develop cardiovascular disease, you may develop metabolic disorder. Do you think that public attitude to, to HIV is really becoming our undoing in so far as that so people of, of my generation and younger see HIV as, as something serious but a chronic infection? Do you think that's really uh, holding us back a little bit? Yes, I, I, I think so. People think today that we don't care about HIV, we can be treated. Uh, of course, it's to take a pill a day. Who is not taking one pill a day? Yeah. Uh, so we have this kind of... Uh, Complacency. Uh, yeah is now the moment for looking for a cure and and why or oh, for for the reason we mentioned at the beginning first of all the berlin patient uh, that was a f really the first uh, case in human of cure secondly people have been identified as what we call elite controllers they never receive any treatment uh, they are infected since more than 10 years, some of them now 15, 16 years. They uh, do not develop the disease. Uh, we are learning from the elite controller, but they are proof of concept, at least of what we call functional cure, or what I prefer personally, remission, long-lasting remission. Which kind of cure are we looking for? Generally, when we are speaking about cure, we are speaking about eradication. That means elimination of all latently infected cells. This is almost impossible mission. Remission is probably our main goal. Remission, that means that we will have 
uh, a long-term health without any uh, treatment, without any risk to transmit to others. I like to say that uh, we might be successful, I'm sure we will be successful in a remission in the future if we work all together as we did in the very early uh, years of HIV research. Would it be your, your crowning achievement, the lifetime's achievement, if, if we can really find a cure or a vaccine? Oh, I mean, that uh, will be a relief for me, you know, if it was a, a vaccine and a cure, uh, uh, it's really a dream, you know. <laughs> uh, but the most things that I'm really uh, concerned about, I, I would not uh, like to leave this world with seeing a re-emerging HIV epidemic. Mm -hmm. That, for me, uh, will be a terrible failure. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, worried about that. The vision of the young generation today regarding uh, this infection, uh, the fact that uh, education information are less than it was, the government are less interested by HIV AIDS. We have a risk. Uh, and the government and the United Nations should take their responsibility. Uh, to avoid uh, this risk. How does that feel as a scientist to see that all of the amazing work discovering all of these things is just blown out of the water because the politicians don't listen? Oh, I mean, that makes you um, not only sad, uh, you are starting to be aggressive. <laughs> uh, that was my, my feeling. Uh, it's how I, I started to join the voice of the activists because I thought that was the only solution uh, to be uh, together with the activists uh, to make pressure on the government. She was fascinating, I thought. That was amazing. It was, it was, just, it was really nice to hear um, sort of her thoughts on the future. And, you know, it's, it's so true that infectious disease will always be so important for human health. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting as well how she was motivated to activism yeah. by the lack of response from politicians. But especially with HIV, it's a big part of the problem. But it's, it's, it's inspiring, you know? It means that what you do, it does actually, in the end, make a difference. At first, the Berlin patient seems to offer hope for everyone with HIV. Francoise and Kirsty explained it's not as simple as that, although it does show that a cure could be possible. But as treatments progress, we shouldn't take our eyes off prevention, for we risk another epidemic. We're here in Lindau with 37 Nobel Prize winning scientists, 600 young researchers, 12 of them sponsored by Mars, and people want to hear all about the science that Mars has been doing. You know, well, the great thing about coming to Lindau is that we get to spend time with science's rock stars. You're aware that you're in the presence of greatness. And the more that we can find ways of engaging some of the finest minds in the world to helping us solve some of these grand challenges, I mean, there's got to be some great stuff in there. One of the things we do is we like to have a lunch where we basically spend time with the young scientists that we've sponsored to come here and tell them a little bit about the kind of company that we are, the kind of work that we do and why we passionately believe that these great scientists should consider coming to a company like Mars for a lifetime career in fun science that will make the world a better place best part really is that you get to actually meet these young scientists who will look at you in the eye and say, this is the best week of my life. To sit with a Nobel laureate and have a conversation, that is a gift. So we have a science breakfast, which is the opportunity for us to host a discussion around a very meaningful area of research of healthy aging. So we have Liz Blackburn, who won a Nobel Prize in this field, 
and we put her together with a group of young scientists in a forum facilitated by ourselves. Let's think about the huge amount of years that human lives are, right? So I made a little scale bar for you on this high-tech thing here. This is a time scale. What's the li maximum lifespan of a, a worm? It goes from here to here, right? Of a fruit fly, from here to here. Now things get a bit better. Okay, let's go all the way out to a mouse. All right, <laughs> keep going, keep going. Okay, we've got up to kindergarten. We've got decades and decades of life. So the science breakfasts are always great fun, highly interactive, and a really good way to have meaningful debate in an area of public interest, but also interest to ourselves. We're in middle age here, so maybe <gasps> somebody's getting some diabetes now. I mean, that's the thing. It's not just your lifespan. There's perhaps years of living with chronic disease. I think you get the point, yeah. right? I'm just constantly struck by how we have to be thinking in terms of enormous timescales that these things are. The world is going to be facing an aging population. We're all going to get older, and there's going to be a lot more of us who are old. How do we deal with that? Helping young scientists realize that they can work with somebody and realize that these are problems that the world has to solve. And business and science can do it together. I think the private sector can play a real role because this sort of research that can be done by a company that isn't necessarily related to just the uh, quarterly bottom line is the kind of research that's complementary to what governments can fund. And I think Mars is a good example of that. So we got 37 Nobel laureates here and just over 600 young scientists and if we can play our role in catalyzing some of the magic happening between those two groups of people then we go away very happy.